So there's one other really useful thing. So how do you pick which predictors to put in your model other than looking at the coefficients and whether the p-values um, are high or not? So there's another way to look at it. Um, so we started off, and I think this is better shown with the code. We started off with one predictor, this one. That was our first model. This is just the same as our first model. I just, and I'll explain why I put it down here um, in a minute. Um, and redid it. So the next thing we would I want to try is percent married in the percent and that same variable we looked at before. Um, I'm going to do that. And the first thing you want to do is look at the outliers. Uh, if you don't have this, if you, if you ever see that, it means your window isn't enough to show the graph. It's yelling at me. Um, so here, if you ever cook's distance again, you have to look really, really close to that to see what the numbers are. Um, but this is telling us what our outliers are again, if you remember. Um, this, the third model I wanted to look at is percent, uh, basically the same, but I'm adding the percent uninsured. So that's the percent that don't have health insurance in each county. So I am going to run that and also look at the outliers. So that gives us a different set of outliers. Here, um, how, this is the easiest way to show what counties are the outliers. You'll see here, this is the row number. This, if you wanna know more about this, go to the R programming. And this is the column number. The column number one is county. And so one of the outliers um, is 68, you can see here. So if I use this code, it's gonna dump out what all my outliers are. So these are all the outlier counties. Um, and then I'm removing them here is basically what's happening. So I'm removing all of them for all of the models that I'm about to run and I'll show why in a second. That's why we're redoing all this. So we're going to run our most simple model. We'll see our summary here. Um, so that is the most simple model. And then we're going to run the ones. Uh, crap. Did we not? MLR data. Huh. I don't know why it's doing that. Hopefully. Huh. What? We're not getting an error there. <laughs> MLR data. No. There we go. I don't know what was going on there. Um, so we're starting off with our most simple model here, adding percent married here, and we are going to add again the uh, the third variable here. So now I'm going to go up and show what this actually. So as I said, multicollinearity, there's no predictors that can be correlated with one another. We only have one predictor. That's why it's not applicable when we have simple linear regression. It, you can't calculate it. Here, we wanna look to see if the percent of high school graduates and higher is correlated with the percent married. It's telling us our BIF scores are real close to one. So we're good to go there. Um, now we're gonna, we have three variables now. Um, and our VIF scores are these. So they're a bigger. Um, that's what you would expect, but they're still close to one. So we do not have a multicollinearity problem. Um, it's not, they're not correlated enough with one another that it's biasing our model at this point. And I'll show an example that is the opposite of that very soon. Um, so now we've run three models. Like everything is still statistically significant. If you look up here, so our coefficients are significant and these are models significant. So which one do I use? This is the third way, the preferred way that I would use. So if you want to see the assumptions, you can go over here and check your assumptions. I already did and they're good to go. So I'm not going to cover that again, but the ANOVA function helps with this. So this is not to be confused with AOB, the function AOB that we actually run an ANOVA on some data. It's a different function. And make sure this is lowercase because there is an 
capital A ANOVA function too. So this is the one you want, um, the lowercase ANOVA. What this is gonna do is gonna run an ANOVA, and I'm gonna go back into my slides for a second. Um, it's gonna compare the models with different numbers of predictors. So basically when you add one predictor, it's gonna compare those models side by side and look at how, if they add a significant uh, level of value um, so basically, how much additional predictors reduce our residual sum of squares? So our error. How much does adding that extra predictor reduce our error value? And then it returns a p-value. So now we'll see here, running the ANOVA. So you can see up here what model one is and what model two is and what model three is. But we want to look at our F statistic here. The model two is actually the best. Uh, so percent uninsured didn't add enough value to make our uh, our error values go down. So it was significant, but this model is going to be give you the most accurate model, which you might not expect. But since we are comparing them side by side, we know that this is the case here. Um, so then we would pick this model. Um, so why did I redo and take out all the same outliers for all the data sets? and make sure there's a reason I, I redid everything. So you'll remember we only for this one got rid of one outlier, whereas in these two, I think we got rid of five. I'm gonna try to run that. Error in ANOVA, models were not all fitted to the same size data set. They have to have the same number of rows in order to run this or it will throw an error and it won't give you an answer. So that's why I was redoing work that we had already done. Um, all right, there's one more concept over at stopping for questions. Um, so you, were, you got into three models and decided two was better than three. If you look at the variables independently of the linear range before you added the model, is that another way to do that? Yes, but just in general, that's kind of like looking at uh, the R squared and the root mean squared error. You kind of have to take a lot, multiple factors into account. This should be your default, to be honest. Okay because we really care about error. Um, and this is a great way, if you can, because if you have different number of rows, you can't use it. So you can't use it in every context. So then you would have to try something else. But in this case, it's telling us how much value is added by that extra variable and by reducing error. So the significance does not always mean that it's valuable. Actually, well, we just looked at uh, that additional variable. Yeah, so it is significant, but in this case, um, and I was actually surprised by this. I didn't totally. So in this case, it the error value for some reason it's not adding, it's not increasing our prediction accuracy. Is a great enough to make it useful. It's not significantly, it might be better, but it's not significantly better than the other one is what you can think of it. So here, just to go over more about multiple regression. So in this case, just to say, to reiterate, um, if we're looking here, um, oh, and here you can see it. So our T value is 10 here versus negative 17 and 15. So that's the, what how significance is actually calculated. So this value might be bigger, but say in the reason it would look like this. So the uninsured might be in general, the mean might be bigger than the percent married. So remember I said units matter. So if you normalize it, then you would. Yeah, if you normalize it, you would see this as lower. Yes, so that's a great example of why normalizing is also really important. So this is just going to be a higher value, but when we actually, because the T statistic is normalized, it's smaller. So it is not adding enough value to, to uh, give more value than say, oh, it will overfit more than it adds value is a great way to say. Um, but here, so kind of coming around, um, so the percent uninsured in 2014, um, so as we increase that percentage by 1%, we're seeing a increase in the heart disease mortality of almost two here. 
So that's what that means again, just coming around. And our adjusted R squared, you see it went up. When we only use one variable, it was basically 5%, now it's 20%. So we're doing a better job of predicting that heart disease mortality, but that's still low, just FYI. At almost no cases is 0.2 gonna be a good R squared. So, all right, are there any other questions? Yes. Go ahead. Yes. So the question is, is ANOVA, can it be used in other circumstances, um, not with linear regression models? The answer is yes. So I did a whole class on ANOVA, so I would recommend going back and looking at the ANOVA. Um, it's very, very, very useful for experiments. That's usually how it's used to evaluate experiments that we do. Like, say, you're looking at the uh, effectiveness uh, or, or in that case seed return based on region. So we could look at and compare the different regions and how much seed return varies by those different regions. That would be a use case. But for this, this that function is specific to linear regression though. Yeah. <clears throat> Any more questions? Uh, yes, we have some time, so. No, no, the R squared, is that covered in another class? Or? No, we covered it earlier. So, I find it, R squared. So that means it's the Pearson's correlation coefficient um, between the predicted and the actual values, and then we square that. I and what it, that we covered last class. So oh, those, those, those videos will be up, but it's looking at the relationship between the predicted and the actual values and whether they varied together basically oh. so for more details that was in the last class and i will have the videos up pretty soon um the holidays have been just extremely busy so um but the slides are up by the way um already so that would go back to an er earlier class 